Um, I hope everybody is well and surviving the heat, depending on where you are. Here in London, it's about 37 degrees at the moment. Uh, in other parts of the country, a little bit cooler. Um, it's nice to see uh, some familiar faces from Saturday's Alba Day of Practice. And it's a real pleasure to have Ajahn Chantasiri taking this evening's class. Um, I'd just like to say a few um, words about um, where we are. This is the last term, uh, last class of this term, and we're going to have a break uh, through, September, through to September, and we meet again on the 12th of September. And obviously the, uh, the link will remain the same, and uh, you might get a circular email if you're on the mailing list. Um, now that things have eased up with the pandemic, uh, we're going to start um, hopefully having hybrid classes, which means that we'll be able to meet at the Buddhist Society. Um, on the 12th, I won't be able to make it, neither will Martin, so that will probably be an online class. Um, the uh, subsequent class, the 19th, might uh, be taught in person, but certainly the 26th will be. Both Martin and I will come in on the 26th and just see how the technology might work with a computer in the class and someone co-hosting from the class. And this is probably a good opportunity um, for me to uh, invite some participation from those who are able to attend the class in person, because um, it would be nice to have a few people who can take care of the technology in the Buddhist society and then take responsibility for closing the room and locking up at the end of the evening. So if you would like to dip a water into being a co-host and facilitating uh, at the Buddhist Society end, uh, that really would be wonderful. And we'll, with the benefit of some trial and error and goodwill, I'm sure we'll be able to put a package together that will allow people to join the class, um, even if you are miles away or in another country, but also start reconnecting on a physical in-person level. Um, we had a day of practice at Amaravati on Saturday, and it was so, so nice to meet together with fellow practitioners uh, who one has known for a long time. And uh, to meet in person was really deeply moving. So I invite you to, to, to join us again from the 12th of September onwards, uh, and uh, certainly from the uh, 26th, just to enable that uh, universal participation in sharing the Dhamma together and practicing together. So I'll probably repeat some of this again uh, towards the end or at the end of the class after Ajahn Chanda Siri has left us. And also answer any questions that some of you may have about how this might work and possibly any questions you might have about what might be involved if you do take this role of being the co-host in the Buddhist society. Um, so that brings us to this evening. So again, welcome to Ajahn Chandasiri. It's wonderful to, to have you with us again. Um, for those who don't know, and I'm not sure, I haven't seen all the names of those joining in this evening. Um, Ajahn Chandasiri is one of the, well, was one of the first nuns to be ordained by Ajahn Sumedho many years ago at Chithas Monastery in Hampshire. She's Scottish by birth. And having been raised as a Christian, continues to appreciate and benefit from contact with contemplative Christians and with those of other faiths. Um, very inspired by her own practice and experience and recognizing the immense benefit that uh, she has gained from it for herself and others that can come about through a life of renunciation. She has actively participated in the evolution of the nuns monastic training and in providing opportunities for women to experience this form of practice. Um, in the Theravada tradition, the role of monastic is key. It's basically the sort of ultimate commitment to uh, an inquiry into truth and into meaning, into the meaning of life. And as such, because of the relationship with the, sangha, the lay sangha, in terms of being completely dependent on the lay community, it creates a very powerful dynamic which I know I personally have benefited from, and many, many of you and fellow practitioners have as well. So 
for most of her life, Fajan Kandasiri has been um, resident either at Chitta Viveka Monastery uh, down in Hampshire or at Amaravati Monastery. But currently she uh, lives and, uh, and teaches and operates from Milton up in Scotland and comes down occasionally to London and we may, may be fortunate enough to have her in present in presence, in physical presence, in person at the Buddhist Society. But we'll see if that does happen, we'll certainly make an announcement uh, on, on, on the website. Um, she's recently returned from leading a retreat in the Czech Republic, um, where she has been going for many years on a regular basis as part of her teaching sort of role in, 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 in the world. So, Sister, uh, I'd like to sort of pass over to you. Thank you again for coming very much. Um, I understand we'll be chanting uh, in English this evening, and Wengdu will be putting up screen share for us with all the relative pages as we come across them. So, welcome, sister, and the floor is all yours. Thank you, Nick. And uh, it's very lovely to be here with everybody, virtually. And I have a small studio audience as well who'll be joining in with the chanting. You may hear their voices. But first of all, I would like to take time to light one candle this evening and some incense, which together with the flowers make up the traditional offerings to the Buddha Dhamma Sangha. So we'll do that now. I'll turn to the shrine. <clears> to <throat> the blessed one, the Lord, <clears throat> to fully attain perfect enlightenment, to, to the teaching which he expounded so well, and to, to the blessed one's disciples who have practiced well. To these, the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha, we render with offerings our rightful homage. It is well for us that the Blessed One, having attained liberation, still had compassion for later generations. May these simple offerings be accepted for our long-lasting benefit and for the happiness it gives us. The Lord, the perfectly enlightened and blessed one, I render homage to the Buddha, the blessed one. The teaching so completely explained by him, I bow to the Dhamma. The Blessed One's disciples who have practiced well, I bow to the Sangha. Now let us pay our preliminary homage to the Buddha. Homage to the blessed, the all and 
perfect, the enlightened one. Homage to the blessed, the whole and perfect, the enlightened one. Homage to the blessed, noble whole and perfect, the enlightened one. Now let us chant the recollection of the Buddha. A good word of the blessed one's reputation has spread as follows. He, the blessed one, is indeed the pure one, the perfectly enlightened one. He is impeccable in conduct and understanding. The accomplished one, the knower of the worlds, he trains perfectly those who wish to be trained. He is teacher of gods and humans. He is awake and holy. Uh -huh. <clears throat> Now let us chant the recollection of the Dhamma. The Dhamma is well expanded by the Blessed One, apparent here and now, timeless, encouraging investigation, leading inwards to be experienced individually by the wise. Now let us chant the recollection of the Sangha. They are the blessed ones, disciples who have practiced well, who have practiced directly, who have practiced insightfully, those who practice with integrity. That is the four pairs, the eight kinds of noble beings. These are the blessed ones, disciples. Such ones are worthy of gifts, worthy of hospitality, worthy of offerings, worthy of respect. They give occasion for incomparable goodness to arise in the world. We live a, a long, hot day, a chance to reflect on these uh, qualities in our lives, wisdom and compassion of the Buddha, the teachings and the truth that the teachings point to, that can be experienced individually by each one of us when we're fully present and the community, those beings who since the time of the Buddha have been inspired by what he teaches, have put the teachings into practice, have found benefit in their own lives and shared that understanding with others right up to the present day. And we continue to support each other through this vehicle of Sangha, the Buddha Dharma the Sangha. Now, uh, Nick is going to make the formal request for the refuges and the precepts, and this is a chance to, uh, again, to affirm our commitment to attuning to Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha, to making these a, a reality in our lives, and to undertaking to, as far as possible, to follow certain very basic ethical guidelines very simple and yet extremely profound in terms of our own practice and understanding and as a way of really bringing something very 
positive, very good into the world, a sense of integrity, a sense of honesty, a sense of harmlessness. Uh, we create a sense of trustworthiness in undertaking these simple guidelines. So we'll do it all in Pali. Well, the, the precepts will do Pali and English, um, but Nick will first of all make the request on behalf of everybody. So over to you, Nick. Just bow three times. Maya Maya Tisaranena Saha Pancha Silani Yachama Doti Yampi Maya Maya Tisaranena Saha Pancha Silani Yachama Tati Yampi Maya Maya Tisaranena Saha Pancha Silani Yachama I'll recite Namo Tassa three times, and then I invite you to recite the, uh, to, to follow this three times, Namo Tassa, and then after that we'll go line by line. <clears throat> Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sambha Sambodhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambodhasa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambodhasa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambodhasa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambudhasa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambudhasa. Budhang saranam gachami. Budhang saranam gachami. Dhammang saranam gachami. Dhammam saranam gachami. Sangham saranam gachami. Sangham saranam gachami. Dutiyam pi budhang saranam gachami. Dutiyam pi budhang saranam gachami. Dutiyam pi dhammang saranam gachami. Dutiyam pi dhammang saranam gachami. Dutiyam pi sangham saranam gachami. Dutiyam pi sangham saranam gachami. Dutiyam pi budhang saranam gachami. Dutiyam pi budhang saranam gachami. Dutiyam pi dhammang saranam gachami. Dutiyam pi dhammang saranam gachami. Atiyam pi sangham saranam gachami. Atiyam pi sangham saranam gachami. Ye saranak kamana nititang. Ama ayi. Panati pata where of mani sikapadang samadhihami. Anati Pata Veramani Sikhapadam Samadhyami. I undertake the precept to refrain from taking the life of any living creature. I undertake the precept to refrain from taking the life of any living creature. Adinna Dana Veramani Sikhapadang Samadhyami. Adinadana verimini sikhapadam samadhyami. I undertake the precept to refrain from taking that which is not given. I undertake the precept to refrain from taking that which is not given. Kame sumi chachara verimini sikhapadam samadhyami. Kame su mi chachara verimini sikhapadam samadhyami. 
I undertake the precept to refrain from sexual misconduct. I undertake the precept to refrain from sexual misconduct. Musa wada where up many see copper dung samadhi hami. Musa wada fair women see copper dung samadhi hami. I undertake the precept to refrain from lying. I undertake the precept to refrain from lying. Sura meraya majapamada tana where mani si kapadang samadhi hami. Sura meraya majapamada tana where mani si kapadang samadhi hami. I undertake the precept to refrain from consuming intoxicating drink and drugs which lead to carelessness. I undertake the precept to refrain from consuming intoxicating drink and drugs which leads to carelessness. Imani pancha si kapadani si lena suga tingyanti si lena boga sampada Si lena ni bu ting yan ti, tas ma si lang wi so ta ye. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. And we bow three times. So we're going to have a period of meditation now. And I invite you to sit comfortably. Uh, if you can do the floor cross-legged, that's perfect. If you prefer to kneel or sit on a chair, that's also completely fine. As I always say, the whole, uh, the important thing is that we have a posture that is reasonably comfortable, so it's not going to be uh, distracting to us if we need to shift and change position a lot and also a posture that suggest, suggests an attitude of alertness. So this is a, a practice of being wide awake, um, attending to what's happening moment by moment. So we'll begin with um, collecting, gathering the mind, um, relaxing the body, just attending to this moment as we experience it. You may like to sit with the eyes closed or if you prefer to have them open, that's also absolutely fine. We sit so that the head is held nicely upright, the face is relaxed, the shoulders are relaxed, with a sense of ease. We're aware of our contact with the floor or the chair or the stool that we're sitting on. Sense of the weight of the body. We're aware also of the space around us. Feeling of the air or the clothes on the skin. We're aware of our surroundings, what's in the space around us, whether it's clear and spacious or it's full of things. Just noticing, taking that into account. The surroundings. We also notice any suns that are impinging on us. Mm. Sounds of traffic, perhaps. People talking, the TV next door. Children, just noticing these things, just allowing them to be there in our awareness as part of this present moment reality as we experience it. Also, we're aware of our inner world. Memories, impressions arising in consciousness. 
things that we've done today, things that we've experienced, seen, heard, things we've tasted, touched, smelled, conversations that we've had. There may be some things that have particularly bothered us or we've been particularly interested in that arise for us as we sit here quietly together. And I invite you to try to set those things to one side. We don't need to concern ourselves with those things right now, just leave them be. And bring the awareness into the body as we experience it. The Buddha encourages us to focus on the breathing, the normal in-breath and the out-breath, as it's happening here, now. Experiencing it directly, aware of the in-breath as it begins, as it continues as it changes and becomes the out-breath. And the out-breath as it begins, continues, ends. Possibly a pause, and then the next in-breath. Seeing if we can attune fully to the sensations of the body breathing. Enjoying the breath, enjoying the breathing. Gently turning aside from those distracting thoughts. Thoughts that draw us into the past, the memories. Thoughts that draw us into the future. Plans, anticipating what's going to happen in the future. Even anticipating the end of the quiet sitting period, we can be waiting for the bell. But when we notice this happening, we just very gently but firmly Set these things to one side. Come back to this moment, this breath, to the Dhamma, to be tasted, to be experienced individually by the wise. We can attune to the Dhamma, the truth of this moment, happening here, happening now. Some people find it helpful to use a word or a phrase as an additional support, an additional reminder. So there's the Buddhist mantra, Bud, as you breathe in, Do, as you breathe out. Bud, Do, Bud, Do. Or you can use secular words, here as you breathe in, now as you breathe out. Or some other word or phrase that you find helpful. Finding a way to attend carefully, but without becoming tense or stressed about it. 
Keeping the face soft. Keeping the shoulders, the hands relaxed. Enjoying the in-breath as it's happening. Enjoying the out-breath. Calming, settling. It can be helpful to be rather modest in your aspiration, particularly if the mind is very restless, agitated. I'll just see if you can enjoy one inhalation, one exhalation, taking all the time in the world to breathe in, Fully enjoy breathing in, taking all the time in the world to breathe out. Allowing a pause, allowing the body to breathe in when it's time to breathe in. The body knows. If you're feeling a bit sleepy, then please sit up nice and straight. Pay attention to how you're sitting. Pay attention to the in-breath, the energizing breath. If necessary, you can open your eyes. Let the mind stays alert, bright, clear.
keeping the elbows a little bit away from the side of the body can be helpful. If you're feeling very hot, just creating a bit of space. Allow the palms of the hands to be uppermost. But there's a cooling there also. Enjoying this moment, this breath, as it happens.
We calm the mind, we gather the awareness so that we're present, we're fully here. And we can observe, we can notice. We notice the flow of breath, continuous changing process. The nature of the body is to breathe. We can be aware of that. We can be aware of other sensations in the body and how these change continuously. Sensations in the hands, the face, the shoulders, the arms. Appreciating that the body is a dynamic process in nature. Always changing. We appreciate that the bodily processes are also part of nature. We can choose to breathe a bit more deeply, a bit more shallowly, a bit faster, a bit slower. But once we've breathed out fully and completely, the in-breath needs to come. This is the nature of the body. Similarly, when we've breathed in fully and completely, there has to be the outbreath, whether we like it or not. It's not under our control. It happens. Similarly with the mind, we can create conditions for calm, bringing the awareness to the breath, supporting a settling, a calming, working with the energy of the mind. discovering the limitations of our capacity to control it. Thoughts will come whether we want them to or not. We can't always think or feel what we want to think or feel, or what we feel is appropriate to think or feel. This is the nature of the mind. In our meditation, we can train it to some degree. Learning how to recognize unhelpful thoughts, to set them to one side, learning how to cultivate helpful thoughts, thoughts of kindness, generosity, compassion, investigation, curiosity.
learning how to work with the mind. Little by little, transforming it. This we can do. Cultivating that capacity to observe, to bear witness to the body, and to the mind itself, knowing this is how it is right now. the last few moments we can simply observe, notice, how is it? Noticing this is how it is. Concluding with a short period of kindness towards ourselves. May this being be well. Deliberately bringing up this thought, may this being be well. Or if you like, you can use your name. So I could say, may, may Chandasiri be well. See if you can do that with sincerity. You might want to have a little bit of a stretch, shift yourself around a little bit, get comfortable, have a drink of water. We're all drinking water up here. It's, it's only 29 degrees here. <clears throat> So to um, really uh, consider the purpose of our meditation. You know, so often we can 
see meditation as a way of uh, calming the mind, making ourselves happy, feeling better about ourselves. <clears throat> and if the mind doesn't calm down in the way that we think it should, then we can feel quite frustrated. And if all of our techniques don't seem to work, uh, we can feel very um, frustrated and upset. Or if they do work, and the mind becomes beautifully calm, but then when the meditation finishes, something happens and the mind gets agitated and upset again. This is something else that can happen. But we have to remember that the Buddha taught a much fuller kind of practice. You know, calming the mind is a very important part of the practice. If you consider the Eightfold Path, just you know the the the, um, uh, the, 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 the last three aspects of the path: you know, right effort, right mindfulness, right focus, and gathering, learning how to gather the awareness, learning how to calm to settle the mind, that's an important part of the path. But the reason that uh, we calm and settle the mind is in order to observe it, in order to come to a, a real understanding of the nature of the mind and the body. Because it's only when we really understand that we can uh, develop the skills needed to enable us to live in harmony with ourselves and with each other and in the society that we live in. We can get very good at calming the mind, but without that understanding, um, and we might get very conceited. We might think, well, I can do all those jhanas. We might feel very proud, better than anybody else. But that's not what the Buddha recommended. There was a wonderful teaching that I probably quoted before. It comes up a few times in the Sutta Nipata, if any of you are familiar with that collection of teachings, where he says, you know, if you think that you're better than anybody else, that's the wrong view. If you think you're worse than everybody else, that's the wrong view. If you think you're the same as everybody else, that too is wrong view. So what was he pointing to? <laughs> what, what, it might sound a bit like a bit nonsense, nonsensical. What, what on earth does that mean? What it means is that any uh, conceptualization of self, of who and what I am, is an incorrect way of of looking at life, looking at things, looking at ourselves in relation to other beings. Now, of course, we've all grown up with a concept of who and what we are. And we all of us have many labels to describe, to describe who and what we are. It's interesting, I received a, a booklet today about um, all the different categories of gender, you know, sort of transgender, bisexual, um, lesbian, gay, straight. And there's lots and lots of uh, different categories and not at all to um, in any way belittle this, but it can be, it, it can be very important to people, you know, the label. Um, you know, I'm a Buddhist nun. I'm a Theravada Buddhist nun. I'm a forest sangha, Theravada Buddhist nun, disciple of Ajahn Chah. <laughs> you know, and on one level, this is important because you know that way you know, there's a sense of the kind of practice that I'm involved with, that I that I you know, and the way I live. So there's a certain group of people like yourselves who will, will know what that means. Uh, but most people won't have a clue. <laughs> it won't mean anything to them. 
Um, and the same with you know, many other labels. Uh, so it's important that we understand what these labels are and why they're helpful and that we learn when it's appropriate to pick them up and when it's simply not relevant. And to consider what, uh, what is their usefulness? And they can be very useful, but they can also create a lot of division, a lot of confusion among people. Political parties, racial identities, skin color. You know, to categorize ourselves on these bases is divisive. To categorize ourselves as human beings is perhaps more helpful. Yeah. Human beings who want to be happy. Human beings who don't want to suffer. This is something we can share. This is something that can bring us together rather than cause division. So I'm very interested in this. You know, for me, it's a, it's a really important contemplation. But I'm also, as part of my practice, very interested when I notice myself um, attaching to a particular label. Uh, when I notice myself thinking, well, I'm one of these and they're something else, they're different. It's important that we notice these things not with a sense of blaming or judging ourselves or feeling that we're wrong, but just noticing what it does to the heart. How does it feel to be identified strongly with one group and to have that group out there, that group separate? How does that division feel? Does it feel good? Well, on one level, it probably does feel good. We're one of these. It gives a sense of, um, of identity, a sense of importance. You, know, you see it in football, you know, different, different um, teams, uh, different clubs. You know, it becomes a very powerful energy as a binding, a bondage among people. Identity it can be very important, but if, if they cling to that, if they take it too seriously, it can also lead to all kinds of, of difficulty, division, conflict. There's a teaching that the Buddha gave. I think it's um, I think it's in the I think he said it in the Madhu Pindika Sutta, number 18 in the Majima Nikaya. Some of you may be familiar with it. A wonderful teaching where he um, is in conversation with a, a very arrogant uh, person from some other tradition who comes to challenge him and kind of asks him what he teaches. And he says something like, I teach a way whereby with no arguments, no contention with anybody. Uh, and Unfortunately, I'm not familiar with, enough with it to uh, go through it in detail, step by step. But it's a brilliant teaching pointing to this tendency that we have uh, to um, have um, biases, uh, inner biases, uh, ways of ways that we automatically respond in certain situations ways that we can be challenged, that we can feel fearful or jealous or 
uh, confused or irritated or angry or um, rejected in different different uh, ways that this can can happen for us. And as disciples of the Buddha, you know, we we um, no, but I should say, but as disciples of the Buddha, rather than um, getting into a blaming or a judging or a criticizing of whoever it is that's um, uh, disturbed us in this way, um, I would suggest that it's much more helpful to turn the awareness inwards and to take a look at what it was that triggered this inner reaction. Why were we upset? Why were we angry? Why were we frightened or confused? You know, when we contemplate the, the noble truths, the noble truth of suffering, uh, you know, there's a tendency that we all have, I think, to look outside for somebody to blame. You know, if we can only find somebody to blame, then uh, we feel better at one level. But it doesn't really get to the root of the problem, does it? The blaming is an unpleasant state kind of reassuring, but when you really go inwards and look at how it feels, it's, it's divisive, it's hot. <laughs> so the way of the Buddha is to understand suffering. What is it that I'm frightened of? What is it that I want? Where am I trying to establish an identity, a sense of being somebody? Can I relinquish that? Can I just be present with this mood, this feeling of agitation, whatever it might be? Can I just be present with that and observe it in the present moment from the perspective of Dhamma? Noticing the upset, noticing the agitation, quietly, calmly breathing through it, allowing it to settle, allowing it to change, learning how to put it down, put down whatever it is that we're contending with. The wonderful quote from Ajahn Chah, if you let go a little, you'll have a little peace. If you let go a lot, you'll have a lot of peace. If you let go completely, you'll have complete peace, complete, perfect peace. Of course, it's not so easy. <laughs> as it sounds, easy to say it. And sometimes it can take a long time for something to fall away. You know, and sometimes we can feel really upset about something. I, think, I know I shouldn't mind, I know I should let go, but I can't. So we need to be very patient, don't we? Very, very patient. Because these habits, they go deep. These habitual ways of seeing things, responding to things. You know, it's a habit of a lifetime. You know, it's our way of dealing with the difficult things we experience in our lives. You know, so we can't just change them overnight, or usually that, that doesn't happen so simply, so easily. Or we might see what we're doing, we might let go for a moment, but then it comes back again. So sometimes we have to repeat it many, 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 many times. But if we're willing to be interested, to be curious about it, then little by little the understanding happens, the understanding comes. We're able to be more at peace, more accepting of ourselves and our difficulties. 
And one of the problems is that we recognize that we, there's a clinging and we tense up around. I shouldn't cling, I shouldn't let go, I'm a hopeless case. And of course that just makes us rigid. We, we narrow our options. Whereas if we can just say, okay, Chandasiri, this is really difficult. Let's just relax with it. Let's just keep relaxing, keep relaxing, keep relaxing. Then we're able to observe in a much broader way the subtleties of the mind, the subtle fears and longings and uh, the sense of you know, needing to be loved, needing to be accepted, needing to be appreciated. <laughs> All these perfectly understandable things. But if we can just learn to love and appreciate and accept ourselves, we can do that. What we find is that that's enough. And the Buddha didn't need to constantly uh, uh, be reassured. <laughs> He wasn't going saying, you know, am I all right? Do you love me? You know, he was at ease. Like this wonderful word, Bhagawa, which I think means sort of something like blessed. And I, I like to contemplate that, this sort of sense of fullness, this sense of ease, um, a sense of just inner, you know, so, so tapping into a sort of fount of, of joy and acceptance and love. My sense is that we all have that, but we forget. And so we look outside. So when we're struggling with something, yeah irritated, sad, confused, upset, or just too hot. Uh, can, we, can we just attune to the moment? Can we just rest in the moment? Use the breath, use the body, just be present with that. Calm, settle. Ask, what, uh, ask, ask what's needed. What do I need to do right now? Certainly there are things that we can do to support, to calm, to settle the mind, to settle the body. We only really know when we're fully present, rather than simply reacting, reaching out for something to make ourselves feel better. Often those remedies actually end up making things a whole lot more complicated, a whole lot worse. So I really encourage this refuge in the Buddha, that which knows, which sees clearly, the Dhamma, this is how it is, this is how it is. <coughs> Tasting the truth of this moment. The Sangha, just remembering that there are countless women and men who over the thousands of years have been contemplating these teachings, have been applying them in their lives finding enormous benefit and we're one of them and we're part of that assembly so i really encourage you to carry on with your practice make it a habit not all habits are bad there are good habits so a daily practice every day make a little time create a space to sit down, to attend, to ask, how is it right now? To notice, this is how it is. There's the body, there's the breath, here, now. So I offer this for your contemplation this evening. I'm going to change position. I have a, a challenging ankle, so I need to move around a bit. <clears throat> and I'd like to offer a space, a time, just to sit quietly and to see if there are any um, questions or any reflections that come up.
um, out of what I've said. Um, and uh, you can send a chat message or you can um, raise your real hand or your virtual hand and uh, Nick perhaps can uh, let me know what it is or, or invite you to unmute and ask your question. Thank you. Is there anything anybody would like to ask? Yes, Mariana, please. Did uh, the Buddha recommend uh, solitude or a balance or uh, depending on the character of people? What was, uh, you know, I am at the point of my life where I could go one way, another or whatever. I missed the second option, solitude or... Or uh, the company of others, the Sangha. Uh, and uh, is there room for maneuver there? Does it depend a lot on uh, people's character, what they feel like, and, and so on? Thank you. That's a good question. Um, the Buddha certainly recommended solitude. Mm -hmm. um, So he would tell, tell the monks, nuns, to go and find a root of a tree and to live at the root of the tree. Actually, I think the nuns weren't allowed to live at roots of trees because it was too dangerous, but the monks were encouraged to go and live at the roots of trees and to, to seek solitude so they could really devote time to meditation. Um, so certainly solitude is something that is encouraged. And I would encourage uh, a certain amount of solitude you know, when you have an opportunity uh, to be quiet, to take time to be alone. Um, but it doesn't have to be like going to spend months and months living in a cave somewhere, but even just like the meditation time you take each day is like a short time of, of solitude. So. By that, I mean a time when you're not engaged um, with other people, a time when the, it, the focus is inward rather than outwards. So I think we all have different tendencies, different characters, and some people are more inclined to solitude. In fact, some people need to have a lot of time each day when they're on their own, or maybe need to go on retreat from time to time just to have time to uh, take stock of their lives. Other time, other other kinds of other people prefer to be with other people and engaged. And if things are difficult, they tend to seek out other people. Um, so there is a it is a question of temperament partly, uh, but I think a certain amount of solitude is always helpful. So you're not always. Uh, with people, not always drawn out or looking for uh, comfort or reassurance from other people. And just finding your own inner resources that I was speaking about earlier. Um, but the amount will depend on each person. The other thing that is interesting, like he talked about um, viveka, a word that you may have come across, which means 
like um, detachment. And there are three different kinds of viveka. There's kaya viveka, which is just physically, like the kaya is the body, so physically removing yourself from people. There is uh, jitta viveka, which is where <clears throat> um, there's a kind of inner detachment, you know, where you're not um, uh, engaging all the time. So you may, you know, be among people, but the heart can can have a sense of um, not being so affected by what's going on round about. Which is, you know, when we're really fully mindful, uh, there's a sense of. Um, so it is non-grasping in an affective way, just that, letting go. Thank you. Yes, that's right. And then there's upadi viveka, which is when that perfect the state of perfect liberation, where you know there's, there's, there's complete, um, <clears throat> um, no longer grasping onto anything. So <clears throat> kaya viveka can actually, you know, you can you can some people they. I remember one time we had a, a sister at Chithurst. I was living at Chithurst Monastery. And she kept saying how she needed more time on her own. And I was puzzled by this because I noticed she actually had a lot of time on her own. You know, she was always in her kuti and you know, going away. Whenever she had an opportunity, she'd go to the forest. And yet she keeps saying, but I don't have any time on my own. And then I, I asked her, I said, well, what, what do you do when you go to your kuti? You know, what, what, what goes on in your mind? I said, do you think a lot about things and think about people? And it turned out that she would physically separate herself, but the whole time she was remembering conversations that she'd had. She was planning what she was going to do with different people and you know, sorting out problems in her mind. So she was in a way physically separate, but mentally she was not. There wasn't that Viveka. Whereas the opposite can also happen, like with Jiddu Viveka, you know, you can be among people, but there can be that detachment that you, you were talking about, where you're, you know, you're certainly aware of the people around you, but there's a sense of um, kind of like an observation rather than being entangled, drawn into um, debates and arguments and discussions. And you know, you, you may find that in your in your life, in your practice, that both both happen. You know, you may be uh, engaging with somebody, having a discussion. You may be in a meeting, and you know, very much engaged, very much caring and involved with what's going on. And then you may just have a moment of, hey, what's going on here? I'm just stepping back and taking a moment of the heart, not not being entangled, not being hot and drawn into. The discussion, just stepping back, you know, that creating a different sense of perspective, a space around um, the discussion, whatever it is. You know, but my sense is that for everybody, a certain amount of solitude is really helpful, physical solitude, um, because that enables us uh, to observe the mind more closely. It enables us to regenerate, because people are very distracting. <laughs> I find. So when I go on retreat, I, I prefer just not even to see anybody because as soon as I see somebody, my mind um, is, um, you know, I start thinking about them or I, you know, that they, 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 it has an effect, the impression. So I seem to need quite a lot of actual solitude, physical solitude. But I also um, celebrate the fact that in the course of the day, um, I can have this jitta this sense of perspective. So I'm not continuously uh, tangled up, entangled with people. So I don't know if that answers the question or do you have yeah. any questions? Yes, thank you. There is also a factor that with age, uh, life seems to offer different uh, things. And while we are younger and engaged in, in activity, we actively seek out people and so on. But later on, we've got a choice, really. Yes, yeah. okay, yeah. And But, you know, out of panic, always trying to get somewhere and connect. And 
Whereas uh, I, I get the impression that the Buddha was saying, mm, mm, mm. <laughs> let, let, let less of that. Calm down. Calm down. Enjoy, enjoy your own company. Learn how to enjoy your own company. Thank you. <clears throat> yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay. We have two okay. questions that have come through on the. I'll read them out. Can you hear me? <laughs> yes, I can hear you fine. Good, okay. As someone who has recently left a strict Christian religion and is wanting to find a new purpose elsewhere, how do you think I should find out what I should do next? That's the question. I won't mention the name because this uh, might go public. So should I read it again or is that enough? Let me just see if I've understood it. So somebody who's recently le left a strict religious uh, commitment is wondering how they Christian what one. they what they should do. Yes, a Christian commitment is wondering how they should proceed to find out what the next step should be. So I think coming to the Buddhist society. Yes, that's essentially the. <laughs> so my answer is coming to the Buddhist society is a very very good uh, first step. Really, you have to feel out for yourself. So um, it can be helpful to um, counter the uh, possible reaction uh, when you step aside from a particular faith that you've been involved in for a long time. Sometimes we can have quite a strong rejection of it, and um, which would be, uh, in a way, could be understandable. Um, but I would encourage you to try to avoid doing that, recognize the inclination to do that, but to take time to take stock of um, what was beneficial and maybe what you found um, less helpful either in the, the teaching or the belief or the way that it was practiced within your particular group. Um, so to, it, it's like a way of just taking stock, you know, bringing yourself up to speed with where you are now. Because I think the next step needs to be um, based on where you are now rather than simply a reaction You know, take time. Take time. There's no, there's no hurry. Just take time to feel it out. Um, and the Buddha was very skillful in how he taught because uh, there's a teaching that many of you will be familiar with, the Kalama Sutta, where this group of people were really confused because, you know, uh, in India at that time there were all kinds of different people going around teaching different things and. The people of this village or city, you know, uh, community were constantly receiving different missionaries from different traditions, each telling them, this is right, this is right. And then the Buddha came and they said, well, you know, we're really confused. All these people saying us that their, their way is right. Well, what would you suggest? And the Buddha said, well, you're quite right to be confused. Of course it's confusing. <laughs> What's important is that you feel out for yourself. You know, if a teaching leads you to a way of life and a way of practice, a way of speaking, a way of acting that produces beneficial results, you know, it helps you to support a sense of calm, sense of happiness, sense of ease, well-being, um, and follow that. If it makes you feel confused and upset and agitated or causes division, you know, for you, from, from, from the society where you live, or your family and so on, and be rather wary of that. You know, what's the result? So I find that quite a helpful guideline, you know, in, in relation to your particular situation. But just take time to feel it out. Is it encouraging you to do things that seem to um, be uh, congruent with your basic beliefs and values? 
not asking you to do anything dishonest, anything harmful, anything that exploits others, anything that causes division, confusion um, among you and your peers. You just take time to feel it out. You know, and little by little, you know, you've come to the Buddhist society, so obviously there's something interesting here. You know, take time. You don't have to call yourself a Buddhist straight away. You know, okay, so you've, you know, you're, you're drawn, you're curious about these teachings. Take time to feel it out. Allow yourself to be nothing for a little while. Uh, step by step. Uh, you know, listen to teachings. There's a lot of teachings online. Uh, lots of audio teachings, lots of um, Dhamma books we have, like through forestsangha.org. Uh, I think there's a website you can look at, or the Buddhist Society no doubt have access to many different websites and traditions. Go take time, look around, feel, feel what feels good feels comfortable and if this feels comfortable then you know stick around here you'd be very welcome so i hope that's helpful and i really wish you well with that but don't 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 be too quick to reject what you've come away from um and don't don't feel that you've been disloyal because i think jesus was probably also interested in people finding a way that supported wholesome qualities and moved away from division and harm. Um, so, uh, as I said, take your time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ashley. Thank you. We have one more question, which I hope we'll have time for, which I'll I'm read out. Yeah, okay. Probably a basic question, but how does one choose a Buddhist tradition? Maybe based on what was discussed, it does not really matter. Question mark. How, do so I, how, how does one choose, choose a Buddhist tradition? Kind of following on from what I've yeah. said, actually, just um, because mm -hmm. each of the traditions has a particular flavor. And, you know, in my experience, I mean, I'm I'm gobsmacked that I'm here. I find it quite extraordinary that I've landed up as a Theravadan Buddhist nun because it was very far from my upbringing. And similarly, I know people who are Tibetans who are totally at home with that. So, whereas I, I wouldn't feel at home with Tibetan Buddhism. I mean, I, I, I love it and I'm interested, but it's not, I'm, I'm not drawn to it in the same way that I am with this. So my sense is that the different traditions suit different temperaments, different backgrounds. So take your time again. And I'm very fortunate that we have the Buddhist society, which kind of offers opportunity to taste each of them. And I don't know if you still have a summer school, but that used to be a wonderful kind of taster opportunity. You can hear teachings, Zen teachings, Tibetan teachings, Theravadan teachings. And, you know, if you find yourself a little bit interested in Theravada, say, then you know, go and visit Amarawati or um, uh, one thing actually I was asked to mention is that um, you're welcome anyone's welcome to come up to Milne Tume you know if you want to if you're looking for somewhere to go for your summer break and if you're willing to uh, fit in with our monastic schedule <laughs> then do do let me know and uh, you, know, you can come and spend a few days here you know so visit different places um, visit some of the Tibetan centers or Zen centers um, talk to people, uh, look, look at the literature. And my sense is that in a short time, you'll, you'll find and you'll, you know, you'll read things and oh yeah, that feels right. Yeah, that feels right. Yes, I, can, I feel comfortable here. Or you might go to somewhere and think, hmm, doesn't feel quite right. Don't feel comfortable here. That's okay. Ajahn Sumedho is one of his big things is, you know, learning how to trust your own intuition. You know, and you may go along for a little while in one tradition, it feels really good, and then something may happen, you think, hmm, not sure. So, you know, it's a matter of really feeling it out. Um, I mean, I don't think you'll find the perfect tradition, <laughs> but 
you know, you, you uh, hopefully you'll find something that's that's good enough, that sits comfortably enough, um, and you can explore it and investigate. So, mm. thank you. For uh, okay. So, thank you. There's one sort of general question. One general question. Yeah. Sorry, there's one general question. Is there a way that I can access the recording of this meeting? I'm not sure that you can answer that question, actually, Achan. It's probably a question that only Odin can answer. Um, well, so the question we, is, is there a way that I can recording? Yeah, yeah, there will be. Um, yeah. It's not, it won't be there yet. And I just have to get my skates on and check the recording, make sure I'm comfortable with it and let Odin know, and then it'll go up on the website. Um, and I'll try and do that within the next day or two. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, I don't know if you'd like to take more questions, but it's, we don't have any in the chat. Just a okay. thank you has appeared in the chat, your answer. Okay. But it's a minute okay. or two at eight o'clock, and I'm sure how you'd like to take it forward. I'd like to take it forward by chanting... Um, the what is it reflection on universal well-being and that's this can be something that you take with yeah. you for your re recess um, this is actually a reflection on the brahma viharas kindness so may i abide in well-being may others abide in well-being uh, compassion may all beings be freed from all suffering uh, gladness May they not be parted from the good fortune they have attained. So celebration of the goodness and beauty of, of people's lives and of our own life. And reflection on karma, that whatever we do, whatever others do, is, um, has an effect. That's an encouragement to live carefully and responsibly. And um, I'm noticing somebody in the studio audience Having trouble. It's, I think you're there. No, you've got it. You've got it. Okay. So. <clears throat> now let us chant a reflection on universal well-being. May I abide in well-being, in freedom from affliction, in freedom from hostility. In freedom from ill will, in freedom from anxiety, and may I maintain well-being in myself. May everyone abide in well-being, in freedom from hostility. In freedom from ill will, in freedom from anxiety, and may they maintain well-being in themselves. May all beings be released from all suffering. And may they not be parted from the good fortune they have attained. When they act upon intention, all beings are the owners of their action and inherit its results. Their future is born from such action, companion to such action, and its results will be their home. All actions with intention, be they skillful or harmful, of such action. They will be the end. And the end is the closing homage. Yeah. And afterwards, if anybody wants to unmute and say bye bye, you can do that. Closing homage. <laughs> Thank you.
The Lord, the perfect, the enlightened, and blessed one, I render homage to the Buddha, the blessed one. The teachings so completely explained by him, I bow to the Dhamma. The Blessed One's disciples, who have practiced well, I bow to the Sangha. Well, thank you very much indeed, Sister. Wonderful to have a class led by you. Look forward to the next one later on in the year. Thank you, Nick, for your Excellent facilitation and hosting. And thank you to Wang Du for his consistent, conscientious supporting of our class with the screen sharing and everything. So thank you, Wang Du. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. You do a very good job there, Wang Du. Thank you, sister. Thank you, Nick. Never, I've never seen you panic once. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.